Church, will you join me in welcoming the whole wide world to Open Door Church? This is the Open Door Experience. Boom. All right. Hallelujah. God bless you guys so much, man. Call you guys blessed. I'm so glad that y'all are here. I love our midweek services. I love our, we kind of let our hair down a little bit in our midweek service, and I like that. And, uh, you know, I, I, I love Sunday services. I really do. I, I love it that we have to have three Sunday services right on. But, man, that's a pretty tight daggum schedule right on. How many of y'all know that I ain't, I ain't into schedules? Has anybody that figured that out yet? They're like, well, you know, I don't like it, but it just is what it is. It's how, it's how we serve people, and it's just a way of serving, and it's a way of all of our teams working together. But I really like Wednesday night because we can be a little bit looser, and we can go a little bit deeper, and to me, it's just more fun. I just like that. I'm so glad to see you guys here tonight. Friends, I'm going to be introducing somebody brand new to Open Door Church, and I'm supposed to make a bunch of announcements, but I'm just going to pass up all my announcements tonight, and I'm just going to go straight into the, into the introduction. Drew Neal is a strategic thinker and a friend of the Holy Spirit. We like him already, don't we? Right? He and his wife, Melissa, have been married for 15 years, and they lead a church that's called Generation One Church that's in a, met, that's in a metro Detroit area. Ministering for nearly 20 years, Drew also travels as a trainer and speaker for developing kingdom culture in your sphere of influence. Does that sound like us? Yes, it does. Drew specializes in activating the prophetic. Oh my gosh, you guys, you guys are, I'm telling you, you're, you're, you're going to love this guy. Um, I could go on and on and tell you that he and his wife live in Oakland, Michigan with their four boys, and his church is Generation One. And I know what it's like to start a church. I know what it's like <clears throat> to be a church builder and to be a church grower. I've seen, I know what it's like to make huge mistakes, and I've seen, I know what it's like to see God do amazing things in spite of you and bring amazing people into your life. And I can tell you this, that I really cherish the relationships that I have. I really do. And it's a really big deal. It's a big deal. Guys, there's a, whenever, whenever the, the Word of God says that Elijah the prophet stood at the valley of dry bones, and God said, can these bones live? And I would imagine that Elijah thought, these are the guys who got that question wrong. I need to get this right. <laughs> so he doesn't say yes, and he doesn't say no. He says, you tell me, thou knowest, because <laughs> these guys did not get it right. I, wanna, I don't want to mess this up. And he said, yeah, they can prophesy to him. And he said, dry bones, you guys need to live. And the Bible says that there was a rattling, and there was a sound, and then... The first thing that happened for a mighty army to raise up and for the dead thing to be transformed into something that was living and amazing was the sinew, which is relationships. The relational parts of the body, before there was a brain, before there was a heart, before there was lungs, the relationships have to be there. I go for leadership training in Vacaville, California uh, once a year. My good friend, Pastor Dave Crone and the amazing team out at the mission. And this brother was out there last year, and I told him, I said, dude, you have got to come to this church. And so we prayed about it. We dreamed about it. And tonight, guys, that dream comes true. My friends, Drew Neal is in the house. Let's give him a great big hand clap. Come on up. Hey! Hallelujah. <laughs> hey, hey. Hey, man. Brother. I love you, brother. <laughs> hey, oh. man. Did you know that I played guitar? I didn't know it, and I love you so much there more now. That, see, yes. That just seems like a good idea. It's a great idea. I promise you it's a great <laughs> idea. Listen, I want you to feel at home here tonight. I Thanks. want you, listen, I trust you. We trust you. These guys here trust me. Right on. And I want you to feel at home. Do, do, do you feel trust at a home? guitar player? They do. Wow, you guys are good. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> they do. But really and truly, I, we, we have been praying about you coming here for a long, long time. And whenever, whenever we left the last Kingdom Connection in Vacaville, when Jerry and I got together, we're like, who out of this connection do we, we must be connected with? And mm. you were the top guy. And, oh, come on. And I'm grateful for you. Thank I, you so much. I know that you had a lot of trouble flying in today, <laughs> and you still made it. The, the, the weather was a little complicated today, but man, we made it, man. Well, listen, I want you to have peace. I want you to know that you're home, and we bless you in Jesus' thank name. Thank you so much. Guys, Drew Neal's in the house. Thank right you. On. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Open Door. Come on. We feeling all right? Man, you guys look good. Man, just turn to your neighbor and say, you look good today. Come on, and look at your other neighbor and say, and we're praying for you. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Don't do that. 
Oh, man. You know, uh, I like being with happy Christians. Any happy Christians in the house tonight? Hey, hey. Come on. How many are thankful that the joy of the Lord is our strength? You know, sometimes we got to remind our face that the joy of the Lord is our strength, though, don't we? You know, I think, I think Christians should be the happiest people in the world. Come on. If it's, if it's good news, our face should look like it. Amen? Man, hey, just look at your neighbor and say, when God made you, he said, I'll never do that again. You're unique. You're fearfully and wonderfully made in his image and his likeness. He, come on. <laughs> Man. I, I, man, I, I like Open Door. This feels real good. You guys love Jesus. I love Jesus. We're going to do a little deep dive tonight. Is that all right? Man, I, well, I just send greetings from Detroit, Michigan, Motor City. Come on. I tell you what, there's something special happening in Detroit that's going to impact the whole world, I believe. And uh, we're calling it the Comeback City. Come on. Time Magazine in 2011 said, if Detroit can make a comeback, it will release hope into the whole nation. And I really believe that. Something special is happening in our city. And so I'm proud to come from Detroit, the D as we call it. I think there's another city around here. Starts with a D, Dallas. Yeah. We pray for all you Dallas Cowboys fans. But of course, we have the Lions, so we need deep intercession. So anyways... But uh, my wife, Melissa, says hello. Actually, 17 years. I think we gave you an old bio, but uh, 17 years in three weeks. My wife and Melissa and I, that's that's great, right? Yeah, isn't that fun? We got four little boys. The newest one is three months old. And uh, so we got a new one showed up here kind of late in the game. We're excited about it. So uh, our church just says hello, and we're just hungry for more of God. We're hungry for for a tangible encounter with the Lord. Uh, Come on, face-to-face encounters with God. How many in one touch with the Lord, everything can change? So I'm just honored to be here with you tonight. I'd like to talk with you about a journey I've been on for about the last two years. About two years ago, I had a moment with the Lord where um, I I began to realize that I was growing pretty comfortable um, with where I was at with the Lord. Anyone ever felt you were just a little comfortable, you know? And, uh, and, and I was kind of in that moment, and, you know, one of the things I, I love is I, I love that God speaks, and, and, uh, and as Troy was reading earlier out of the bio, you know, I, I love doing prophetic training. I love, been all over the world, actually, and, and uh, multiple continents, and just had a blast the last 10 years, just encouraging people they can hear the voice of God, and, and so... Um, But in that, I was, you know, I began to realize with the Lord that it didn't take a lot of faith anymore for me to hear God's voice. How many know that if it's truly relationship and I'm his child and he's my father, that should be happening all the time. You know, one of the great things about the prophetic is that it dignifies the fact that we are his kids. How many know that that'd be a little bit of a strange family relationship if you were never allowed to talk to your father, but he was always around? And so, you know, I think one of the great things about the prophetic is we're demystifying it and we're realizing that it's just simply hearing his voice. And so, um, but I begin to have this conversation with the Lord and I begin to do inventory about all these things that I'm doing all the time that have really just become relationship for me. And, uh, and I don't have to intercede anymore to hear God's voice. I just go and I say, God, I want to hear your voice. And I listen and we interact and we have communion. And I begin to go down the line and I realize I needed to put a little more weight on the bar. How many of you, if you want to build muscle in your body, you got to put some more weight on the bar, amen? And I begin to realize that um, I was uh, was leading a church in 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 an area that was um, dealing with a lot of challenges. Detroit, 50% of Detroit's population and the proper limits of the city is functionally illiterate. In America, functionally illiterate. The, the statistics on poverty in, in Detroit will blow your mind. The, 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 the level of legacy poverty that has just continued to go over and over and over. Uh, the need there is so tremendous. And, you know, one, only one in six high school students read at grade level. 99% of children who don't know how to read at, at average level by third grade Um, Well, let me re-say that. 99% of children who read at average level in third grade don't go to jail. And so we've been populating the criminal justice system simply not out of an intelligence issue, but out of a family wholeness issue. I heard a story recently about a young child. He was eight years old. 
and he was, uh, he was not reading at grade level in third grade. And so we have an initiative where we jumped in with a, a great organization, Beyond Basics, and we're doing literacy mentorship in Detroit Public Schools. And, uh, and so we were hearing this story, and this young man, he was not reading at grade level. And they said, you know, this child's so brilliant, but he can't stay awake at school. And so he's not learning at school. He's sleeping at school. And, and uh, we said, well, why is he sleeping at school? They said, because every night when he goes home, um, or every afternoon he goes home, um, after he's around for a few hours, his mom kicks him out of the house till 2 o'clock in the morning while her boyfriend is over. And the child has had to hang out on the front porch or hang out on the streets, whatever. And, uh, and so we, we, don't, we, don't have a, we don't have an intelligence issue. We have an opportunity issue. And so we don't want to give hands out. We want to give people a hand up and give them opportunities. And so I began to realize that my church was surrounded by opportunity to put a little more weight on the bar. We were surrounded with opportunity to begin to ask the Lord, what would it look like for heaven to invade Detroit and not just have a visitation of a blessing moment, but what would the builder's anointing look like, a movement of reformation that that city would truly begin to look like God. And I begin to build a heart and a passion for the city. And, uh, and, and this is really part of an apostolic profile, biblically, that we see that, man, when you're hungry for God, you can't help but want to love your city. I think we got some people who love their city around here. Come on. And so the Lord began to invite me into a season of discovering what it would mean to truly be a person of impact. And we can throw that first slide up here. And so I began to ask the Lord, what it would mean to be a person of impact? And so I've been spending the last two years training people how to make disciples of nations and their sphere of influence, shifting and elevating this message of reformation alongside the message of revival. And so we're going to jump right into this. And so we can go to that next slide there. And so we have an opportunity to ask, what is this mission that we're on? Jesus in Matthew 28, he gave the Great Commission, you all know it, and I believe he said something so important before the famous part of go, and he said, all power in heaven and earth do I have in my name, now go. How many know that anything that's a part of the Great Commission is pretty intimidating? It's called the Great Commission for a reason. And, uh, and so, you know, we, we love talking about healing the sick. Come on. How many are excited about the movement of signs and wonders in the earth right now? I mean, what a powerful time to be alive. And, uh, you know, cast out demons, you know, and, and, and baptizing people in the name of the Lord Jesus, raising the dead. We have more documented resurrections right now than any other time in history. It's a great time to be alive. So I begin to hone in, though, in this passage, and the Lord elevated making disciples of nations. And I really believe that this is where the message of influence begins to elevate in the gospel. You know, many of us have thought about making disciples um, simply from the sense of having Bible studies, and we want to get them to understand the Bible and have biblical principles, which is all very true. But we ha I believe that there's an upgrade that's needed, and, and there's a biblical profile of the reformer that God's willing to elevate right now that I'd like to share with you tonight. And so this mission that God's given us is a great commission, but it's a little extraordinary, and it's going to require people who can think a little bit differently to truly sustain tangible impact. Next slide. I really believe that we have a what, and it's to disciple nations. Behind that what is also the idea of, of our why of bringing heaven to earth. You know, how many know that we're trying, we're not trying to get to heaven, we're trying to get heaven to move through us, amen? And, uh, and so your who is your sphere of influence, our when is go. How many know that we have permission to go, amen? Look at your neighbor and say, you have permission. We have permission to go. Of course, our wares, our metron, and the people groups and the locations that we're called to. And I really believe that this message I'm going to talk to you about today, impact is a how. Is a how. You know, the church is very inspired with what? We're very inspired with miracles. We're very inspired by the message of the kingdom. We're very inspired by the listening of the word. But I think sometimes we lack practical steps on how to demonstrate the kingdom everywhere that we go. So I want to give you a how message here tonight. And that next slide will start us off here. And uh, we need a strategy from heaven to have sustainable impact. How many know that if we have a plan that's just made off of man's abilities, then it'll be our responsibility to multiply it. But when we have heaven's idea, it's God's responsibility to multiply it. 
Come on, the Bible says that we plant and we water, but it's God who brings the increase. How many are thankful that we're not responsible for the increase? We're just responsible to say yes. We plant and we water. It's God who brings the increase. And so we need tangible impact. Next slide is great. And so sustainable impact in the world requires believers to look like Jesus. How many know that we have a little bit of a discrepancy today where we have people who've adopted a a, a sinner's prayer moment. They've had an encounter with Lord. They're saved in their heart, but they're pagan still in their mind. You see, we can't just think about Jesus. We need to think like Jesus. Can I get a big amen on that? Come on. And so I really, I really believe that there's a movement of renewing the mind that's happening right now. And I believe to be people of impact that truly brings impact in your sphere of influence outside of the walls, things that reform cities, things that change our businesses, things that reform the education realm, things that change our nuclear families, we need to look like Jesus because Jesus is the only answer. He's the only answer. There's narratives that are out right now. Come on, there's all kinds of crazy things happening in the world. Come on, nations are being shaken. Governments are being shaken. Economies are being shaken. But Jesus is on the throne. Can I get a big amen? We don't need our nation to look like an elected official. We don't need our nation to look like a new Instagram account. Come on, somebody. We don't need, we don't need, we need our nation to look like Jesus. How many are thankful that Jesus wasn't a Republican? He wasn't a Democrat. Come on, how many know that the kingdom of heaven is a higher government? And in in the culture, the kingdom of heaven is the solution for all things. And so we need to begin to shift out of this, out of idea and into practical expression where we allow the kingdom of heaven to confront the systems of the world and not in a sense of anger or war, but in a sense of saying, hey, we're going to invite you into something that's actually going to bless your life, sustain goodness in your life, bring peace into your life, bring a little of that joy in your life. Can I get a big amen? We need sustainable impact, which is a plan from heaven. We need to look like Jesus. Next slide. And so we need that face-to-face encounter. It starts with refreshing, right? This is a church of refreshing. You can sense God's presence here. Praise God. How many are thankful that we get to be face-to-face with the Father? But how many know that revival is not a destination unto itself? Come on, I love the encounter with the Lord. Anybody have some wacky, wild stories with Jesus? I got, I, I got some wacky, wild stories. I've had encounters with the Lord. I was, I was visited by the Lord on my ninth birthday, tangible presence of God in my room. And I woke up out of a deep sleep, two o'clock in the morning, speaking in other tongues. And uh, I just had this marvelous encounter with God. And he's, he's longing to interact. You know, at the age of eight, I was healed of lymphoma cancer. I had, a, I had a tumor on the side of my neck the size of a grapefruit. And God dissolved this tumor overnight. Come on, somebody. Come on, face to face with God is amazing. But how many know that just because I'm healed doesn't mean that's the end of the story? Come on, I I don't need, I'm not just looking to receive God. I'm a a conduit that God's wanting to move through me. And so so we have this need for for refreshing and face to face encounter. And and in this expression is identity and, and finding out who we really are. And I tell you what, I've had some moments where I couldn't even stand the presence of God was so powerful. I'm on the floor. And in that moment, it's just like this download of who God believes I am is coming. Anyone ever had that love encounter with Jesus? I tell you what, I had a love encounter with Jesus about 10 years ago and it changed my life. And I began to realize that, uh, you know, there was nothing that I could do to make God love me more. Come on, he loves you right now full on. Come on, somebody. I said, you can't do anything right now to make God love you more. He loves you with all of his heart, his soul, his mind, and his strength. If he was a human, which he came as Jesus and he was, he would have given all of that, all of who we are, all of who he is. It's fully accessible right now. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm God's favorite. (laughs) Next slide. And so we owe the world this encounter of love. Come on, how many know that, that our gathering is not a destination, it's a launch pad? Come on, our gathering should be celebrations of what we did Monday through Saturday. Come on, somebody. 
Come on, our gathering should be celebrating the reality that God is present and he wants to move through me when I'm out in the world. Come on, there's a few people who are scared of the world and Christianity and it blows my mind away because last time I checked, light always beats out darkness. In fact, darkness isn't even a substance. It's simply the absence of light. You know, it's interesting because I've never walked into my house and flipped on a light switch and an argument ensued between darkness and light about who's in charge. Light always wins. Come on, Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Come on, I got a little light that's shining inside of me, somebody. I got it on a lampstand, and everywhere I go, I bring the kingdom of heaven. And so I'm not scared of sin. I'm not, I'm not, uh, you, you, so, come on. How many of Jesus wasn't scared of sin, was he? We got a lot of Christians who are scared of sin. You know, last time I checked, you know, in the old covenant, you get around a leper, you get leprosy. But in the new covenant, you get around leprosy, and they get healed. That's good news. Come on, I'm excited about bringing life everywhere that I go. I'm an encounter waiting to happen. We owe the world this encounter. Next slide. And I really believe this leads us to a place of societal transformation. You see, we're, we're, not, just, we're, we're not just people who have an encounter so that we can feel good about ourselves. We've not just experienced grace to be free from our past. When we experience the, the moment of grace, it, it catapults us into our, into our future. Grace frees us from our past, and it empowers us with a supernatural capacity to continue to overcome. It's always forward in its nature. Amen? Amen. And so when we begin to realize that I'm not just free from my past, I'm not just delivered, I'm not just rescued, but I've been positioned to become an encounter, I've been positioned to become a solution, as we're going to talk about, I've been positioned to go do something, I now have a future, and I need to begin to think about it. You've got a purpose. God has a dream in his heart about who you are. God sees you in the future, and you look much better than you do today. You know, some of you have doubts about your future. You know, you, you're trying to determine your future according to your past. But God's lens is always future present. He doesn't look at the past. Come on, somebody. I said it's impossible for God to look at your past. He, look at, he looks at you in the future, and then he loves you in the present towards that future version. You know, if you have some doubts, Graham Cook, he taught me this. He, you know, he says, you know, if you have some doubts, do you know how to fight it? Do you know how to fight your doubts? You doubt them. You just doubt those doubts. You just say, hey, I think I'm going to flush that one. And I'm going to have a new thought. Come on, somebody. <laughs> And so this societal transformation, God has a dream. You know, there's a seven mountains conversation that's going on. You guys heard about the seven mountains? Seven spheres of influence. Um, there's some people who had some conversations about, you know, 40, 50 years ago. And they broke up society in these realms of government, business, education, family, um, arts and entertainment, media, and, and the local church. And, and, uh, and they said, what if we could put all the world in these different spheres? And then what if we could bring the kingdom of God into these places, leading with influence? You see, there's this, most of the church is very motivated out of compassion. We're very priestly in our capacity. But we don't realize that we're also called to be kings. And as a king, you have to learn how to live in influence. Compassion meets the need of one. Influence meets the need of many. And so the gospel centered on meeting the need of one, but I can open up my Bible and show you all kinds of moments where Jesus transformed the lives of many in one moment. And that didn't come because he was a poor carpenter. That didn't come because he was broke. That didn't come because he wasn't famous. It came because he was a rock star rabbi who had leveraged influence over a long period of time, had leveraged cultural institutions of government and education to demand that people pay attention to him. You know, I always think about in Matthew chapter 5, how did Jesus get thousands of people to show up to his first message? You ever thought about that one? His, his ministry is just beginning. You know, oh, he sent out a Facebook invite. That's what he did, yeah. That's what he did, Facebook invite, yeah. Maybe he got on his, his MailChimp or his constant contact, sent out some mass email, that's what he did, some sponsored ads. 
<laughs> Why would anyone, you know, we, we've, we've created a form of Jesus that looks a lot more like us in our past state than what Jesus was trying to do is introduce us to a new strategy of reformation and influence to bring alongside that compassion and the meeting of the one. I believe we need to relearn Jesus. I believe Jesus is better than we think. Eight years ago, I had an encounter with a rabbi and uh, a Jewish rabbi, and it changed my life and, and it's led me down this path. I know you guys, you guys love Israel around here, praise God. And, uh, and so I've, I've actually gotten certified in first century history out of Israel Bible Center. And, and, uh, and I, I believe there's a capacity to understand Jesus is better than we think. But we've made Jesus in our own image oftentimes here in Western Christianity. And, uh, and so we, we have a need to really engage with the strategy that Jesus had. And, and I really believe he had a distinct strategy. And, and I believe he was a person of impact. Next slide. Let's look at this. All right, we pursue personal revival for the cause of societal transformation. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a reformer. Come on, next slide. The message of the kingdom doesn't teach you what to think. It teaches you how to think. One of the challenges in, in, in organized religion is that most of the time, we eliminate people's right to ask questions. This is a very Jewish um, uh, behavior that empowered, you know, really their whole culture was they, they allowed people to ask questions. And in that came the empowerment of understanding that God could be bigger than we currently understand. Come on, put your hand on your own, on your own head and say, self, I give you permission to be blown away. Father God, blow my mind away. Be bigger than I understand. Come on, that's a powerful prayer, isn't it? I don't want God in my image. I, I, I was made in God's image. I want to think like him. I don't want him thinking like me. Come on, the moment you have the market cornered on theology, you've made God in your own image. It's true. You see, because God's invited us to this progressive moment to know him more every single day. I, I married my wife, you know, 17 years ago, and it's so fun. We were young, you know, and in love, and a little bit of puppy love going on, and we met swing dancing. And, uh, you know, that, that, you know, like jitterbug, I have, you know, we, that's how we met. Yeah, we met in the late 90s, and that was kind of a thing. You know, the Gap commercials, all this stuff. Anyways, and so we've got this puppy love thing going on, and, and we, I like, it was enough to say I do. But what's true today is that I know way more about my wife. I'm way more in love with her today than what I was 17 years ago. And it's in the process, in the journey of engaging in relationship that I've known her more than what I did then. Now that love was enough to get into a marriage covenant. Come on, somebody. But the revelation of who she is has been progressive over time as I've gotten to know her. How many know that if I would have limited who she was to what I knew of her when we were married, I'd had a rough marriage? Come on. Marriage is grand. Divorce is 100 grand. <laughs> My mentor friend, Ed Duff, if he's watching, that's his joke. I give him credit for that one. He's inviting us in to know him more clearly, to know him deeper. Every day there's an invitation for God to be bigger than you currently understand. And so God doesn't want to teach us what to think. He wants to teach us how to think. We need to think like him so we can begin to represent him in every situation that we're in. Next slide, please. And so it's time to think like Jesus. Romans chapter 12, verse 3 says, Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove the acceptable and perfect will of God. I like to say it this way. You are one thought away from transformation. Come on, you're one thought away from transformation. Nowhere does Jesus ever say, I want your heart. He wants your mind. He wants you to think like him. He wants you to begin to process and, and love one another like he would love. Come on. Give like he would give. Be motivated like he would be motivated. Come on. How many know he wants your mind? You are what this scripture says that transformation is found when we begin to think differently according to the word. And when we do, it proves the acceptable and perfect will of God. I don't know about you, but I'd like to prove some of that acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. 
Next slide. And so discipling nations, this mandate out of Matthew 28, it's not a calling for vocational ministers. This is a calling for you. Look at your neighbor and say, he's talking to you. You know, I don't believe there's no, I, there's no such thing as full-time ministers and then everyone else. I believe we are all called to full-time ministry everywhere that we go, every moment, every day. You know, and what's amazing is that your employer pays you to be in full-time ministry. When you're at the water cooler and you're encouraging people, you're getting paid to do that. When you're on the phone and you're doing sales and you're, you're, you're trying to help someone figure out a problem, hey, you're getting to be Jesus and love them in that moment, and you're getting paid to do it. You're in full-time ministry. Come on, it's about all, all how you look at it, right? I like answering sales calls at home and then just prophesying over them when they call. I'm like, I don't want your product, but is your name Emily, by the way? <laughs> what? That'll turn a sales call upside so down real fast. <laughs> Next slide. You are a reformer meant to represent the kingdom in your sphere of influence. You have a sphere of influence. It might be your neighborhood. It might be your business. It might be, um, you know, uh, the PTA. It might be the knitting club. It might be whatever it, want, whatever it is, your interests, um, your, your business, your career, the place where you're going. You have a sphere of influence, which is a group of people who look to you for inspiration and guidance. And what's true is if you have the kingdom of God in you, a lot of people are paying attention to you. Because you can't help but be drawn to love when it gets demonstrated. You can't help but be drawn to joy when someone's oh, you know, happy all the time. You can't help. The world is starving for encouragement. Amen. Like, you know, the thing I love about the prophetic is that it's founded in encouragement. The church is starving for encouragement, actually. <laughs> I mean, you, you just show up and start encouraging people. And, you know, uh, I got the, the, the tear barometer. <laughs> the faster a Christian cries, the more starved for encouragement they are. I mean that. We need to encourage each other more. Do you know you're surrounded by world changers right now? But they need to hear it. They need to hear that they're valuable. They need to hear that it's a safe space for them to be who they're called to be and that we need you to be fully you all the time. The world's not going to transform because we all decided to be the same person. It's going to be transformed when the whole body shows up representing Jesus in the unique ways that we all carry. You know, I believe that 50% of our revelation of God is vertical. It's in prayer, it's in worship, it's through the word, it's, it's this connection of what we have between us and the Lord. And 50% of our revelation of God is horizontal and is founded in the people around us. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made in his image, you're fearfully and wonderfully made in his image, and yet we're different. Which means who you are in Christ carries a revelation that I'll never understand until I encounter the Christ in you. Come on, somebody. Look at your neighbor and say, I like the Christ in you. What if we treated people according to the Christ in them and not according to their past? Not counting their trespasses against them. Come on. Ministry of reconciliation. Ambassadors were called to be Jesus' ministry. The only time it's ever paraphrased with one, one theme, and it is the ministry of reconciliation, restoring people back to the Father, and then it's verified, it's defined as this. Reconciliation, not counting their trespasses against them. The most scandalous scripture happens four verses earlier where it says, from now on, I regard no one according to the flesh. Someone say no one. No. It's in your Bible. That's radical stuff. What would it look like to love your neighbor who may or may not know Jesus the way that you know Jesus, but you love the gold inside of them, come on, and you pull it out? It doesn't take a specialist to find dirt in a gold mine. It takes a specialist to find gold in a gold mine. And I think we're all gold miners out in the world wanting to bring transformation, real sustainable impact so that the world will begin to look like Jesus. We like calling them pre-Christians. 
You might not know that you're a Christian yet, but when I introduce you to your father and you realize who your Savior is, you're, you're going to realize who you really are, and you're going to, come on, profess Jesus as Christ. They're just pre-Christians. I'm not offended. It's my brother. I'll nudge you real quick. So to be lost, you first have to be possessed. To be defined as lost, you first have to be possessed. I would like to propose to you that we're on a journey of helping people return home. People aren't our enemy. Principalities are our enemy. People are our brothers and sisters, and we need them to come home. And we got to release the love of God. Come on. That, uh, that radical love of God is going to transform the world. Whew. Next slide. What if discipling nations isn't about landmass and borders? What if it's my neighborhood, my city, my business? What if these are nations? What if biblically this is people groups, you know, right? What if you had more tools in the sinner's prayer and church services? How many know that Jesus never invited anyone to church and he never said, pray after me? He never did it. Doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means that Jesus used other tools. We need to learn these tools. We need to relearn Jesus and understand the tools he used to transform the world around him. There are more tools. What if the gospel was designed to solve the world's greatest problems? I would like to propose to you that if you don't believe the gospel can solve the world's greatest problems, you might have a deluded gospel. Most of us in our gospel perspective are so eternal oriented that we miss out on the idea that heaven wants to show in my life right now. And that God wants to solve injustice right now. Come on, I've been called to be restored body, soul, and spirit. God isn't concerned with only my soul. Jesus never asked for anyone's soul. He never won souls. He wanted wholeness. The goal of the kingdom is not a, a competition between churches on Instagram to talk about how many people got saved at their Easter service. I'm sorry if you guys posted that. I don't even know if you did. And there's nothing wrong with that once again. But how many guys know that Jesus wants whole people, body, soul, and spirit? Not just a bunch of robots who said a prayer one time and never changed. We need to look like Jesus. We can't just think about Jesus. We need to look like Jesus. We need the love of Jesus. We need the joy of Jesus. We need the strength of Jesus. This is real impact. This is what we're called to. Next slide. You aren't a problem, you're a solution. Look at your neighbor and say, you're not a problem, you're a solution. I like to say it this way too. You're not in the way of the plan of God. You are the plan of God. Come on, somebody. God does not want to work outside of you. The only way that God works in the earth is through people. That's the plan. That's the plan. You're the plan. You're it. Heaven on earth isn't going to happen through a glory cloud. Heaven on earth is going to happen when you look like Jesus. What do you think a bride without spot or wrinkle is going to look like? You looking like Jesus. And so we're just in process right now of looking a little bit more like Jesus today than we did yesterday. And then a little bit more like Jesus. I mean, come on. How many know the world's getting better? There's a few in the front row like, amen, amen. Oh, no, sorry. Mm -hmm. I got an amen quote. I like this. You guys are awesome. I would like to propose to you that the world's getting better. And I can prove it to you. Who wants to go back in the era where there was no running water? Anybody want to do that? How about when there was no hospitals? Anyone want to do that? How many of you want to go back before the printing press when 95% of the population was illiterate and had no control of information except for the corrupt leaders? Anyone want to go back there? How about we go back in less than 100 years and we take away women's rights to vote? Anyone want to do that? How about we overturn civil rights? Anyone want to do that? How many know the world is getting better? Come on, somebody. I said the world is getting better. Come on. 
How many are thankful we live in a country? I'm going to rabbit trail. I've got to stop. I'm running out of time. That was the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. It's like my first time here, I'm going to get invited back. Anyways, you're not a problem. You're a solution. I like to call you solutionaries. Next slide. Fathers are visionaries. Mothers are missionaries. Disciples are solutionaries. Come on, you're a solutionary. You're not a problem. You're a solution. The brilliance of heaven, Christ in you, is the hope of glory. How does glory show itself in the earth? When people are dignified with, like, insurmountable value. You see, the thing that's been happening over time is that wars are becoming less frequent. Slavery is getting abolished. People are being dignified. Children can have a voice. Women can have a voice. Minorities can have a voice. Over time, what's happening is that all of civilization, all of creation is being elevated to a place where they realize they have equal access to God. And so what's happening is the, whole, the glory of God is filling the earth as people realize who they are in Christ. But we got a few problems to solve still. We've had a vision and we've had some missionaries, but we need some solutionaries. Sons and daughters who are going to really say, hey, God, how do you see the situation? How do we get more water into this nation? How do we eliminate poverty in this place over here? How do we solve this artificial, conund- artificial intelligence conundrum we have on our hands? The robots are coming. They are. Watch the videos. They're coming. Robots are making robots. It's interesting, everybody. Next slide. So disciples are solutionaries. These are some powerful questions. What challenges are we facing as a society that the gospel could solve? What part of the gospel would Jesus highlight to meet the current needs of our day? If he was, up, if he was, up, uh, if he was to show up for the first time, How do you live the supernatural mandate of the kingdom? Come on. Love the local church and have tangible outcomes that impact society. We don't just need church services and we don't just need outreach programs. We need people who are bringing the kingdom everywhere that they go and becoming that kingdom solution in their sphere of influence. Can I get a big amen on that? Next slide. Top 10 limited beliefs to why we don't disciple nations. Why don't we disciple our sphere of influence? Why do sometimes we hide in our buildings and not bring the impact? Well, these are some limited beliefs right here. We think that nations in the Bible means landmass with borders. We think events are greater than relationship. It's someone else's job. I don't even know my purpose. Uh, They have a church mindset versus a kingdom mindset. How many know that the kingdom doesn't come out of the church? The church comes out of the kingdom. Yeah, they, uh, the orphan or poverty mentality. Some people think the supernatural isn't for today. They might think that a five-minute sinner's prayer is the only solution that they have. It's a good solution, but how many know that that prayer is just a door, and then there's a whole world of living like Jesus after that, amen? we got to raise up disciples, people who think like Jesus. And they also, we have a hard time diagnosing problems and we think that secondary issues are primary issues. A perfect example in the mission field is we think that money is going to solve problems and we send money and we end up destroying local economies. During the earthquake in Haiti, there was a, there was a soap business and this, uh, this Haitian man, he had, uh, he had you know, do, a, about a dozen families he was employing making soap. Haitians were buying soap. After the earthquake, of course, it was, it was a terrible crisis. And Americans, being good people that we are, being very generous, we sent literally, I believe, over a million units of soap into Haiti for free. Guess what happened to this Haitian man's business? We put him out of business. We eliminated 12 sources of income that were feeding probably somewhere around 50 children. In our generosity, we may have overreached because we didn't allow distribution and generation to balance, to be in balance. And so we have some mindsets we got to overcome. we got to learn how to be solutionaries. Next slide. I'm so over time. Here we go. I'm going to try to wrap this up very quickly. So to be people of impact, the Lord told me we need upgrades in six areas. In our innovation, in our mobilization, in our purpose, in our activation, in our connection, and in our transformation. 
People of impact, this is the special recipe right here. I believe upgrades in these six areas is going to build you up as a solutionary. Someone look at your neighbor and say, I'm a solutionary. How about you? To become a solutionary, you need upgrades in six areas. And it's innovation, mobilization, purpose, activation, connection, and transformation. Next slide, please. And so I believe that within these six areas is a biblical profile or an upgrade that's going to elevate the David heart, the Joseph favor, the Nehemiah focus, the Daniel spirit, the Solomon wisdom, and the integration of Paul. One of the most radical things that happened in Paul's ministry is that he said someone who wasn't included was now included. How many know there's, that, that, that's tension filled? Only the Jews have eternal security. Only the Jews are chosen by God. And all of a sudden Paul's like, no, I have a revelation that none of you had and it's not in the Bible. Let that mess with your theology a little bit. Your bibliology. He said the Gentiles are included. They're included. We have to learn how to understand that value of people is central to the gospel being expressed and experienced. And if people don't have the chance to encounter the Lord before we've already decided whether they're in or they're out, we've taken on the role of the accuser and not the ministry of reconciliation. I need a big amen on that one, please. This is the real you, the heart of David. I wish if I had time I could break all these down for you. Next slide gets even more complicated because I got all kinds of stuff to say about this. I have a whole school of impact that I lead and I have, all, I have 12 audios on all this stuff there in the back. You guys can grab it. But God's moving us from an old wineskin to a new wineskin. Essentially is what's going on. And there's a biblical profile of the reformer that God's elevating so that we can be solutionaries who have sustainable impact. And you know what? I believe that you're a person of impact. You're called to be a person of impact everywhere that you go. As I was praying leading up to this service, I had, I had this picture of, uh, of my family. We were, we were moving from Kentucky to Michigan. I was a kid. We had a 24-foot truck. Anyone ever moved across state lines before? That's a lot of work, isn't it? So my family, we moved uh, 26 times before I was 20 years old, all right? We were moving, planting churches, doing all that whole thing, and uh, on an Abraham journey. And so I remember being in this, in this pickup truck, not a pickup truck, a moving truck with my dad, bench seat and I'm sitting there we're you know riding along and he's driving making it go and uh and so we're in that slow lane and and I, I remember hearing the 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 engine and I'm like dad what's that noise and uh he said well son that's a governor I said what's a governor dad he said well it's a limiter that doesn't allow that uh, that uh limits the capacity for the engine to make the the vehicle go faster it's a safety feature. You know, and I was praying, coming into this, I saw that picture, and I just really feel like today that many of us in our Christian experience are constantly having to reevaluate, reevaluate the place and the point where we, we put a limiter, a governor, on our potential. Your potential is not connected to your ability, but your potential is connected to your identity in Christ. You know, there's some of you who are like, well, Drew, I'm a little intimidated. I don't know if I can talk to my neighbor, and I don't know if I have a nation. I don't know if I'm called to go on the mission. I don't, I don't know. I feel like I'm called to go to Hawaii. <laughs> Amen. Here I am, Lord, send me. But I wanted to come here today all the way from Michigan to tell you this. You're not a problem. You're a solution. And that all of heaven is on you, it's in you, and there is not a single situation, there's not a problem that you can't solve. You see, because every, a problem is a situation without a solution. And God, through Jesus, has already solved every problem in the world. We just have to connect with his heart, with his love, with his passion, 
and understand that when we give ourselves to our true identity, that we can hear him clearly, that we can know him deeply, and that we can understand his heart for the things and the people that are around us. You see, to be a solutionary, we can't just get excited about solving problems, though. We can't just get excited about maybe even just innovating and, and saying, hey, I can make this thing and maybe people will use it. I really believe that there's these, these couple of keys, and I'll end with this. First of all, to be a solutionary, to be a person of impact, to solve the world's greatest problems, we need to first take on the spirit of adoption. You see, problems are things that are connected to people. And if we're just solving problems but not loving people, we've missed the point of the gospel. And so what would it look like if we were willing to adopt people groups? I love that they're talking about India and these different places and, and uh, going around the world. This is the spirit of adoption in play here in this house. But what if you could adopt your neighborhood? What if you could adopt your neighbor? What if you could adopt that grumpy employee in the cubicle next to you that everyone doesn't like? And then secondly, what if you could affirm their insurmountable value? Adopt them, affirm their value, and then third, accept responsibility for God's heart to want to solve their problem through the brilliance of heaven. You don't gain the anointing for things you're not willing to accept responsibility for. You see, some of us are, you know, Monday morning quarterbacking the world right now. Well, if I was president, <laughs> this is what I would do. If I was the president of the homeowners association, we could color our door red. If I was coaching Johnny's team, Johnny get more playing time. It's easy to have opinions. It's sacrificial to accept responsibility. You see, we've been, we've been prophesying at things, and we've been praying at things, and we've been interceding at things. And in the end, asking for God to send a solution, and we've missed out on the very point that it's me. It's you. God, reform Hollywood. Weird prophets want to destroy Hollywood. I mean, that crazy things get said about Hollywood. New Orleans, Thailand, Amsterdam. We got lots of weird things that we do that Jesus never did. You see, Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, but he came to, to, that it would have life and life more abundantly. What if we went on mission in Hollywood? What if we went on mission in Thailand? What if we went on mission in Amsterdam? Come on, somebody. What if we went, come on. It's going to require us to bring the change. Christ in me is the hope of glory. I've been given the power unto salvation. I've been given the power unto miracles. I've been given the power to create wealth. I've been given the power unto wisdom. Come on, somebody. I've got the power. You've got the power. The Lord's saying, hey, heaven will come to earth when you are willing to go. Amen. To your neighbor, to your boss, to your enemy, who's actually not your enemy because people aren't your enemy. Who is God asking you to love? What place in your life do you know that you could elevate your impact if you just realized who you really were and that you have the ability to change that world, that nation, that realm, that sphere of influence? God made you the right way the first time. We're just in process of learning how it works redeemed. Getting rid of old thinking and getting on the right thinking. How, how many know that God isn't in the, 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 the remodeling business? I'm a new creation. The former things have passed away, and behold, all things are new. Someone say all. all. It's a guarantee. 
It's new. And God's just waiting for us to catch up. So, Father, we thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you that we're not a problem, we're a solution. That we truly are people of impact. That, Lord, by your spirit, we're able to go out into the world and transform the world that it would look more like you. We just ask your presence to come, your spirit to speak. We invite you right now, Holy Spirit, to show us a person, show us a realm, a neighborhood, a cubicle, a family member. Lord, who is it that we're supposed to adopt? I release the spirit of adoption into the room right now in Jesus' mighty name. That, Lord, we would love those who could never give something back in return. And that, Lord, we would make a commitment to dignify them with insurmountable value. And then believe that we carry in the renewed mind the brilliance of heaven to solve the problems. Through the power of the gospel, spirit of revelation, we ask you to come right now. Upgrade, 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 upgrade. Upgrade, upgrade, upgrade. The whole earth groans for the sons of God to rise. It groans for you. Someone is praying right now. Lord, send me a deliverer. And it's you. It's you. You're not a problem. You're a solution. It's you. The love of God in you is enough. The hope of his goodness is enough inside of you. You have what it takes. You've been made ready. You have all the, of heaven inside of you. Now go. Just go. All power in heaven and earth do I have in my name, Jesus said. Now go. Father, we thank you. that you've made us in your image and your likeness. That we could be an encounter of your love everywhere that we go. So God, let that love pour out of us as we think like you to be people of impact, bringing the solutions of your love everywhere that we go. I release that blessing here in Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen, amen. God bless you guys. Open door. Let's give the Lord a praise. He's so good, amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. Amen.